Now, you said when we came in, you said you saw the uh, Lamar Odom episode of People's Party. Yeah. And you said you were drawn to it because of his addiction issues. Yes. You have famously had addiction issues. Oh, yeah. And you famously went sober. Yeah. And um, how is sobriety affecting your work? How is it affecting your family life? Um, well, I wouldn't have a family without sobriety, mm -hmm. first and foremost. Uh, Belle would have never signed up for <laughs> the old version of me. <laughs> she would have been like, you're funny, but not that funny. <laughs> How you doing, party people? It's Talib Kweli, the MCEO, the BKMC. This is another episode of the People's Party. Welcome back. I got the lovely and talented Jasmine Lee with us, as always. How y'all doing? Give it up for Jasmine Lee in the house. What's up, guys? Hey, Jasmine, how are you doing? I'm good. I've missed you a little bit. Missed you too. Oh. Well, you know, it's been a whole week. I know, it's been a while. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of fun this episode. I am bringing to the People's Party table a friend of mine, a renaissance man, an actor, a writer, a performer, an all-around American badass. Dax motherfucking Shepard is in the house tonight. Make it, make some noise, give it up. <laughs> oh, what up, Dax? What an introduction. Oh. A renaissance man. <laughs> oh. I think that's my first time being called that. Hey, you just became one, I think. <laughs> yeah, officially. Someone will enter it into Wikipedia and it'll yeah, be man, you got for life. A motorcycle helmet and overalls. It's just in case it gets gnarly between you and I, <laughs> pop this on and let them fly. Now, when we did your show, The Armchair Expert. Yes, you were early on, and I thank you for your bravery. Oh, it was good. It's a beautiful, wonderful show. Thank um, you. It's become one of the more popular podcasts. Um, you had overalls on. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's like a thing now. Yeah, well, okay. I, the, the history is I wore overalls in high school, mm -hmm. um, Carhartt overalls, and uh I've, I've always loved them. I wear them a lot because I ride a motorcycle, and on your motorcycle, your shirt will blow up and back unless you got the overalls on. So they're really practical. Okay. You don't want to moon anybody, uh, right? So, but I did wear them early on, and it did become a thing. Like I remember hearing Ellen on on uh, Stern talk about the fact that she had no intention of dancing every episode. Mm. It's just something they did in the pilot; mm -hmm. wasn't planned. Turns out people liked it, mm -hmm. so now she has to dance she every has single. To dance. Yes, mm -hmm. and she says it's, it hurts. She, you know, her her body hurts. <laughs> at this point, but what's she gonna do? I was watching Ellen the other day and the sheer volume of the yelling of her fans was mm. just almost offensive. I was <laughs> like, whoa, what's going on on the television? Well, what you don't see, uh, unless you're a guest on the show, you're sitting in the green room ready to go out. Mm -hmm. And there's just a live feed of the audience, and uh, they're dancing for yeah. an hour before the show starts. Yes. And each person's coming down. It's like old Soul Train stuff, where they're coming down, <laughs> everyone's like turning their attention to them, and then they do the whole thing. Or we had a dance show in Detroit called The All New Dance Show, which was I was addicted to. I watched it every day after school mm -hmm. uh, in a basement of some building. And people just going for broke at 3 p.m., I mm -hmm. think, is when they film the show. Right. Going for yeah. broke? What is that term? Just letting it all hang out. Oh, okay. Yeah, 100%, living out loud, dancing with full throttle at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Like nobody is watching. Ooh. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> they, they had tricked themselves that they were not being mm -hmm. filmed, and it was... Uh, it was it, contagious. Going for broke. I encourage everyone to go on YouTube and look up the right. all-new dance show. Go for broke. Go yeah. for broke. Go for broke. Now, we talked about uh, Detroit when I did your show, Armchair Expert. Detroit right now is like a case study for gentrification. Mm. Uh-huh. What are your feelings on how the city is changing? Well, uh, you know, I lived there at the nadir of the apocalyptic kind of desertion of the city. Mm -hmm. So I lived there in 94. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a complicated issue because I can tell you I just was home uh, two weeks ago. I was downtown. I did the Fox Theater. Mm -hmm. And then I went and got Coney Dog and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's so much nicer. It's crazy. People mm -hmm. are walking around. The city's vibrant. I wasn't, having been there at the very bottom of it, I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know if this place can come back. It's mm -hmm. just 100 years of industry seeped into the ground. All you know, fire coming out of the ground in these mm -hmm. fields. Uh, so I think this is happening in Los Angeles as well. I think it's- a, Brooklyn as well. Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, Brooklyn. 
It's uh, it, it's interesting because I am liberal by nature, and I am I also believe in capitalism, and I believe in investment, and I believe that you, you, in order for people to put money into a place, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be expectations, and I think it's a really complicated answer. I think there's, I just interviewed Garcetti, mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles, and we brought this up because my thing was I'm a liberal. And I benefited from rent control when I was broke for 10 years here. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, the, the kind of, you know, the Constitution has two goals, mm -hmm. equality and liberty. And those things don't match up always. They're, they're right. opposed quite right. often. So part of me says, well, hold on. Does anyone have a right to live in Beverly Hills? Mm -hmm. Do people have a right? I, I have a right to live in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. I kind of would go, no, no one has a right to live in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And that seems obvious, but then if you extend that out to Los Angeles, Los Angeles is New York City, it's Tokyo, it's mm -hmm. London. It's a place people city. want to be here. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a supply and demand issue yeah. and uh, I I don't I'm never willing to exit reality to support my kind of political position on things. I it, right. it, and that's what was cool about interviewing the mayor is the mayor has to make the city run. He may have entered or mm -hmm. she may have entered with certain politics and in mm -hmm. ideologies. But where the rubber meets the road, they got to make the city function, and quite often you'll see people moving more mm. into a pragmatic direction. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's. Oh, but what I was going to say is, I thought he had a really interesting idea, which was, he wants growth for LA. He wants us to build more. He also wants to supplement people who are on the cusp of losing their apartment, because mm -hmm. once that happens, now you're homeless, and now even if you're a fiscal conservative, now we're going to be paying thirty thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. for services of emergency rooms and all this stuff. So even economically, it makes sense to keep people in in houses. Right. Um, I think was. What most, are your thoughts on gentrification? Well, you know, I think what's most interesting about your answer is that you threw in that you are a liberal but also a capitalist. Uh -huh. And I think that um, obviously we live in a capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if we're talking about politics and we're talking about uh, mayors, if you're talking about the mayor, he's the mayor of a in a capitalist system. Sure. So he has to play by those rules. Yeah. There's a lot of people in my community. I come from like a, a sort of an activist community. Mm -hmm. A lot of people uh, are are staunchly anti-capitalist yeah. and there are also to be fair a lot of people who think the idea of saying that they are anti-capitalist is sexy yeah. but they're not really anti-capitalist uh, yes. by the way that they live and behave and they like nikes and other I, things i right? think what a lot of people that are anti-capitalist really are is capitalists with um restrictions capitalists with oversight capitalists mm -hmm. with regulation Right. Which is, right, the when you look at part. Europe, that, that's really what you're kind of looking at. Mm -hmm. But but for, for people, look, it'd be one thing if we were having this conversation in a vacuum on Mars, but we do have data and we do have history. And the reason communism did not work, mm -hmm. above all things, forget the ideology, when you have a centralized location making decisions for far-reaching issues, mm -hmm. the market, mm -hmm. They can't be made in real time. They can't be, you can't adjust from Moscow what's happening in Siberia in a bread line. But if you let the people who make the bread and the consumers, if you let them sort it out, they'll sort it out. People can sort shit out. The market will answer these problems. So that's why I believe uh, communism, forget the ideology, is, is fundamentally flawed. Is just you can't have a centralized entity solving problems in a country 3,000 miles wide with 300 million people. I don't think it works. But... Um, that's not to say, interestingly, that it couldn't now with like AI. In the future, mm -hmm. it is possible that a centralized AI could be making the best decisions for all people real time this fast. But yeah. just currently, that's not what happens. I, um, I don't consider myself a communist. I agree with your criticisms of communism. Mm -hmm. um, I don't consider myself a capitalist, mm -hmm. even though I live and work in a capitalist system, um, because I have... Uh, common critis criticisms of capitalism that some people who might lean communists have. Right. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting in the inter and we're talking about gentrification mm -hmm. because gentrification is a result of capitalism. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. not going to yeah. have like it's like that's what it is. So if you're already making a stand like, OK, well, I'm a capitalist, which is what you said, mm -hmm. then you kind of have to accept some of the gentrification. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes an issue for people of color and for poor mm -hmm. people because they're, they're often the ones that are pushed out first. But that, again, is a result of capitalism. Yes. So the, the, uh, but, but really quick, can we just explore that? Mm -hmm. So is the solution to that, they are getting pushed out disproportionately, mm -hmm. the same way they're disproportionately incarcerated, the, all mm -hmm. these things. There's no denying that that's obvious. Um, but is the solution 
to fix the end result as opposed to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't brown people be able to compete at the same level as white people and make the same resources and live in the same city? To mm -hmm. me, it's like, wh let's solve that problem. Let's, let's have, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, just as the gentrification, because I actually live in an uh, area that is being gentrified, and my problem with it, and as you're saying, um, you know, fix the problem of why can't black and brown people be on the same level as white people? They're kicking people. They're 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 bringing in money and making better um, living environments for other people instead of going in and fixing the city for the people that are already living there. Why? But when you think about. Um, Low income, that is like a problem that messes up everything. People are stealing more because they're not making enough money. They're stealing more because they can't make enough money to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. And if you fix that problem, then we could probably have a lot less people in jail. We could probably pay on a lot more better playing fields. But it's just not fair for people that have lived in a place their whole life, for them to see it getting fixed up and you getting kicked out. And right now the rent in LA is just outrageous. It, it really is. It is outrageous, but my question is, should it be cheap? Should the should the second best city in the country be cheap to live in? It or should the, be affordable. Should be affordable. It should be affordable. See, I more think people should make enough money to live here. That's the side of the the the, the equation that I'd like to focus on. Is 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 let's in, enable people to generate an income that would allow them to live here. Um, that like to me seems like a long term solution. It's like as a, a war on poverty thing. Yeah, which I just want to be very clear. I'm not arguing for any kind of trickle-down bullshit or anything right. like that. I'm just saying, in it, if we achieve some utopian uh, objective in this country where uh, everyone had the same access, everyone had the same privileges, everyone had the same support, now it's just game on. Can you? Can, are, is your hustle good enough that you can live in L.A.? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I, I'm up for. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, but again, I just want to also be clear. I am, um, I'll take a lot of positions when you and I debate. <laughs> right. We've done this. Yeah. Ultimately, I just want to say my real position is I am not on the right, but I respect the right for carrying the torch of liberty. That's what they're going to do. They're, car they're worried about individuals, and we on the left are worried about the mass mm -hmm. and the community. And both are great. They're great. Both are very virtuous pursuits in in any discourse, you need someone pointing out like, hey, that's kind of disincentivizing this thing that we kind of all value. I appreciate that. Right. I think what you're talking about, and I, I know that you don't consider yourself a right wing person or consider yourself a conservative at all. No, right? no. But if we're talking about politics, you know, I'm we're both we're, we're the born born the same year. We're the same yeah, age. Yeah, yeah. So we're old enough to remember that even Back in the day when Reagan was the Trump of the Republican Party. Right. And Reagan is considered, you know, they love terrible. Him. Well, I'm talking in the black community, oh, Reagan, oh, Reagan oh, is considered yeah, yeah, yeah. American. <laughs> America, <laughs> no, he's no, no, the Republicans. Right? Yeah, he's a he's superhero. A guy, yeah. Right? yeah. But in the black community, he's like a demon. Mm -hmm. Right. He's mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, he's like, de like demonized. Uh, well, de demonized might not even be the right word because some of it he might have actually earned. Right? Sure, sure. So even in that era, the conservative uh, people who spoke on television, the ones who wrote in magazines, the ones who wrote in newspapers, they had a certain amount of respect for the people on the other side. Right. And it was a certain amount of uh, discourse and dialogue. And I think that's when you saw uh, uh, Kamala Harris uh, uh, argue with Joe Biden mm -hmm. uh, on the stage. And what she said was, he started out saying, you know, we, I got together with people who I knew were racist. Right. And I was able to get something done. Uh -huh. And she's like, you knew they were racist. Mm -hmm. Why are you celebrating them? Mm -hmm. And so uh -huh. that argument becomes, well, do we just deplatform this racism? Or, you know, it becomes an argument of, of whether or not that talk is uh -huh. worth having. Mm -hmm. Well, I would argue, as we sit here mm -hmm. in the aftermath of it, it was incredibly worth having. Mm -hmm. I, I think it pointed I out. I think to it was worth having too. I think, but I think Joe Biden is tone deaf to certain issues. Whereas I, in the way that he frames it, yeah. and the way that he talks about it, he gave her, he gave her ammunition uh -huh. because he was a, he, he he didn't acknowledge in the right way mm -hmm. that who he was the harm the harmfulness of who he was dealing with. He was more yeah, excited yes. about his ability to 
get something done. Yes, and so I'm not defending him. Right, right, right. He's not my pick. And neither am I. I'm yeah, not yeah, defending yeah, yeah. him or com Kamala. Right, right, right. So right. he's he's not my pick. I'm not defending him. But you and I have touched on this a little bit, and then I just interviewed uh, Kamal Bell, and he and I talked about it too. I think the reason you'll see a lot of white folks dig in is because the stakes seem so fucking high. Like, if, if he were to concede he erred, mm -hmm. he might now take on a label of a racist for the rest of his life. And because there doesn't seem to be a gradient between mm -hmm. David Duke and um, and um, uh, Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. not getting the Black Lives Matter message right, mm -hmm. Because there's no gradient in there. It's not like, oh, she's a two and he's a 10. Mm -hmm. It's just racist. You're David Duke. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I'm going to defend that I'm not David Duke. Right. I'm going to defend that I'm not a Nazi. Now, it, mm -hmm. am I biased? Fuck yeah, I'm a human being. I categorize everywhere I look. There, there's there's uh, us and them. Mm -hmm. there, you know, and I'm trying to transcend that and I'm trying to evolve past that. But it has to start with me feeling safe enough to admit that. Admitting it is, is the key. And yeah. I think that's what, with race, I think America hasn't dealt seriously or honestly with the issue of race. Mm -hmm. I agree that he's not going to back down from that position. But when it comes to uh, sexism, mm -hmm. when it comes to Creepy Joe, yeah. he's going to make a video and he's going to unbutton his thing. He's going to be like, look, I'm just a handsy guy. Uh -huh. You know, he's going he's gonna to own that. Did he that. do that? He did. He yeah. made a video. Oh. And he made like a sort of <laughs> apology for how many people he's been groping. Okay. You, right? This is not an appropriate joke, but I made it and I want to <laughs> share it with you. I said if he doubled down on that whole thing uh -huh. and just his campaign was Joe Biden feeling it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I think people will be like, no, that's fucked up, but now I'm kind of in. Right, like they did for Trump. Yes, yes, They did for Trump. I was right. like, well, if he just went, though, he ran right at it and just said, Joe Biden, feeling it, 2020. Right. <laughs> feeling it. Had little hands. Had Again, little, anyone, who is, anyone who's background? felt diminished by his touching, I apologize to you, but right. just uh, for the community, I think the joke's worth making. Yes, okay. I, I think it was a funny joke. <laughs> um, I don't know if we're going to keep that in there. I'm saying it was, his joke was funny, but... Um, <laughs> um, you just punch right to the joke. Yeah. You skip all the lead up. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, no. No context. Oh, no. Yeah, context. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you get edited that way, right? People, like, they'll take the shit you said. The yeah, and they cut out some real, the real pertinent words. Yeah, yeah all the yeah. time. People all the time. Yeah. Um, I get edited like that on Twitter. People change my tweets. Yeah. You and I met on Twitter. Yes, we did. Um, yeah. We became friends on Twitter because our, our Twitter trolls overlap. Uh -huh. Well, mostly I'm just a huge fan of yours, and I was following. I'm a fan you. of yours yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. But you, you started jumping in. Would you say you find a lot of your friends through Twitter beefs? The people who have come on this show, yes, mm. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. Like, this show has sort of developed out of my conversations on Twitter and the wonderful people I meet. Right. Right. And you're right. one of these people. But I, we do, we do, because you started to jump in. And sort of help out. Sure, sure, sure. You know, yeah. here and there, sparingly. Uh, yeah. Right. And then, and then we started DMing and be like, okay, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna try to check out your show. You're gonna try to check out my show. Yes. You came to my show with uh, Joy Bryant. Yes, yes. And um. My wife. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> my television wife. T TV her. wife. Yeah. And um, I, I introduced you as an all-American badass because you was ready to thump. You know what I'm saying? Like oh, somebody, sure, sure, somebody sure. deserved a fade. <laughs> like one of those Twitter people showed up at my yes, show. Yes, yes he did. And he protested the show. He was holding up a fuck quality sign mm -hmm. outside of the show. Mm -hmm. And fans went out there and they tore up his sign. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And then he came back and he's woofing outside. He's tweeting at me. And I'm, I'm on Twitter and, and you were like, what are you looking at? I'm like, there's some guy outside saying he's outside and he wants to fight and wow. he, you're like well let's go outside let's go <laughs> yeah, yeah, i'm like yeah yeah, yeah. Shoot him face. it's, it's one of the ready. worst parts of my personality but yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you just see me when i was an alcoholic it was much oh, worse oh, yeah God. yeah but we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about addiction as well but i i say that to say that um i really appreciate you oh you know thank you. and i appreciate in that moment it was and you can see it on youtube i'm sure for people who are watching but um you know it wasn't violent no it wasn't um irrational yeah it was just like well let's see what's going on and you know i've had friends say to me um you're so funny and laid back it's weird that you have this history of getting in a lot of fights and i've um and i'm like yeah i'm never screaming i'm not I i'm like oh we're playing one-on-one -on -one. let's do it like I, if you look <laughs> in that video i'm smiling i'm like right. oh something's about to go down those are the ones you gotta <laughs> worry right, about the i'm ones right in the prime spot to drop this gentleman <laughs> right. uh and i'm kind of giddy and again i right. hate this part of myself i i i i, I attribute it to growing up in a, you know, in a in a lower income blue collar town where uh, you you won glory by you know fighting mm -hmm. at the movie theater on Friday night. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, I feel like um, part of that. Also, raised without a dad, so I'm right. like, anytime I get male approval, sign me up. You know, I <laughs> jump, jump over a fire, I'm in. Ride a wheelie on a motorcycle, I'll learn that. You sound like Kanye West uh, at the uh, White House. Uh, <laughs> I call that cafeteria syndrome because you feel like you have to fight because if you don't, when you go to the cafeteria, everyone's going to talk about you the next. Oh day. yeah, or, or or even worse, and this is what I would really struggle with if I had a son, is. You don't fight back, and then the rest of your ride in school is mm -hmm. you're, you're the bullied. dude that someone's going to earn their stripes on. And you're like, I'd rather go down swinging, and then the next guy knows, like, it's going to be a fight, you know. Now, was punk your introduction to Hollywood and to yes. this world? Yes. I had been out here for about 10 years Before auditioning and, okay. and getting nothing. The part of your personality that you just apologized for, I feel like, had to do with why you got punked. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. They were like, who can improv and is not afraid if it goes sideways? Right. And they found me. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, punk is sort of the godfather of this YouTube prank culture. Mm. Um, I think so. You mm -hmm. know, but a lot of it, punk had very specific rules. You know, your friends and certain, you know, it was just it was like it was done tastefully. Yeah. Right? Well, what's interesting is that's not my personal sense of humor. Like, mm -hmm. um, we've hung out. My, I, I have no judgment of it either. Mm -hmm. Like, these du dudes who do roasts and stuff and the mm -hmm. women who do roasts, they're great at it. Jeff Ross is a genius. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> she does I do roast battle oh, with okay. Jeff Ross. Yeah. Yes, right. I do. <laughs> so, I I'm all for it. I, this is not me. Like, mm -hmm. that wasn't how <clears throat> my friends all got along mm -hmm. growing up. I'm more, I'll make jokes that I know are kind of... You know, uh, they're generally going to be at my expense, I'll, okay. I'll say, you know. So uh, so it was weird to, to, to take on that role where you really were just fucking with people <laughs> in sometimes right. a nearly criminal way. And I was like, I can, I can do this. It's not necessarily like what I would go out and do. But right. so because when I was on that so show. So it was a I, job for you. Yeah. When I was on the show and I got to do interviews and stuff, they would go like, you know, what's the most recent prank you pulled? I'm like, I, I'm, too, I'm too lazy to pull pranks. <laughs> like, you know, if right. someone, if 12 other people plan it, I'll show up and, and try to execute it. But right. it's not my nature to plan a Like you hear Clooney on these talk shows. He's got all these stories about like pooping in a guy's litter box. They trick That's the guy disgusting. into thinking his cat had a human sized. I mean, there's this elaborate <laughs> nine steps. And I'm like, that you, that's a lot of time. He's bored. And God bless you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking yeah. of you know, punked and jokes and pranks and you famously pranked uh, a friend of mine, Justin Timberlake. Oh, right, right. That's right. really the episode that made our show big. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, he too. was kind of really like coming on as a huge entity in, right. in that. Yeah, I think that really propelled us into. And now you're working with him again. Yes, in theory. Yes. In theory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's wheel? a producer oh, on the show. Oh, he's a producer. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I, I, he, he hasn't given me a pep talk yet okay. or anything. Yeah. You're really busy, man. <laughs> I know. I like know. you're like the white Steve Harvey. All of a sudden. Oh, thank <laughs> you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Or the uh, or the less white Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> <laughs> No, I love Brian Seacrest. <laughs> and he started on American Idol, right? He did, yeah. He and uh, the, the other guy, I remember, was Dunkelman. Yeah, but I don't know where Duncan was. Yeah. Um, I pray for his safe return. <laughs> oh, before we move on, I just have to say, oh. you're in one of my favorite all-time movies. What movie? Baby Mama. Oh, sure. And one of my favorite quotes is when she breaks up with you and you're like, I'm going to bang all your friends. Consider your friends banged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've said that to an ex before. Consider them banged. Banged. Yeah, and the, my license plate, I think, said my girlfriend rocks. My, my girlfriend rocks. My girlfriend does not rock. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, my favorite role of yours is... um. You're like you're you did King of the Hill and you did Idiocracy and I'm a huge Mike Judge fan. I'm yeah. like from back in the days when he had the band Judge. Like I've been following Mike Judge entire career. Yes. Um Frito was a fucking idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? One of the dumbest available. One in of the, the future. dumbest characters I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're clearly not an idiot. <laughs> right, right. right? Yeah. So I, was that I play a lot of idiots. <laughs> it takes a lot of hard work to play an idiot, actually. <laughs> I think it's hardest for my mom, you know, because she's like, you went to college. Why? <laughs> no one thinks you're smart. And I'm like, yeah. Um, <laughs> the check's still cash. I was watching an interview with you, and you were talking about your favorite movies, and you mentioned The Thief by Michael Mann, which I haven't seen, so I'm going to go check that out. Oof. But then you said Raising Arizona. Yes. And that's like a movie I watch once a month. Yes. It's... I talk about the salad days because of that movie. I'm like, I, I describe my youth as the salad days. Uh huh. You know, and I always hear Hunt's voice in the back, like, that was nice. As the, <laughs> as the sun, sunrise, sunset goes down. I was just in Michigan last week, and I was my childhood best friend, Aaron Weekly, and I were like walking through the woods with our daughters. And uh, out of nowhere, he goes, 
when we didn't have crawdads, we <laughs> ate sand. You ate what? We ate sand. <laughs> and then, of course, I go, I made my own crawdads once. Right. Mama used to make them in a big old pot of water. I didn't use water. Kind of came out <laughs> like black popcorn. Like, those, all those lines are just cemented in yeah, my... Yeah, man, that's like my favorite comedy. That was like a... And we're the same age. I don't know if it was the same for you, but I watched that movie, and it's actually the very first time I thought about the mechanics of the movie. Of I'm like, movie. why is this? Like when he steals the Pampers or the mm -hmm. Huggies, and they go on that long set piece where the dogs are chasing him mm -hmm. through the grocery store. Then which, by the way, rivals Ronan with Robert De Niro and <laughs> rivals Steve McQueen Bullet as one of the best car chase scenes of all time. <laughs> yes. yes. And so, and then he flies out the window of the pickup truck and lands in the grass, right? Mm -hmm. And I was watching it and I just became aware of like, why does this look so different? Like, mm -hmm. what is what is going on? Why is this so funny? How did they show a guy fly through the window? Mm -hmm. How are they showing the dog's point of view run through the right, hallway? Right, right. How, how is all that happening? Not, not that I figured it out then, and it was decades later. In fact, on Miller's Crossing, there's an amazing extra on the DVD where the DP of all the early Kona Brothers movies um, explains why it looks like that. Mm -hmm. And it's just all about lenses. It's like a tutorial on lenses. Mm -hmm. And I watched it and I was like, oh my God, this is great. I didn't have to go to film school. I get mm -hmm. it now. You mm -hmm. can get everything on YouTube. You can oh, be yeah. an expert on anything watching YouTube. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And like any tool was great. But what I've been experiencing recently is um, you know, as you know, like for my Twitter engagement, I argue with people all the time and I'm debating people all the time and I'm realizing that the people that are the least informed are the people who come to me and say, I depend on YouTube for everything. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like the people sure. who like, because what's happening is it's, it's all confirmation bias. They're watching YouTube videos made by people they like, whose opinions they agree with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're just going down those rabbit holes and just staying there. And then it gets to the point where you can't even present them any other information because no. they're like, I didn't see that on YouTube. Yeah, it, it's almost like watching an addict, which is like, you're not gonna talk sense into them. You're just gonna hope that the bottom comes as quick as possible. Yeah. Because the result of that, I, I believe, the, the uh, wormhole of confirmation bias is, first of all, it's an old adage, you find what you're looking for. Yeah, you know, and, they, they have and that goes in life. Like yeah. if if I'm walking around thinking everyone thinks I'm dumb, guess what? I will hear a confirmation of that everywhere. I, you know, mm -hmm. whatever my fear is and whatever chip I have on my shoulder, I'll, it'll get confirmed. But um, I do just hope that the the, res, the net result of that is um, I'm not happy. And why aren't I happy? And why aren't I connecting with people? And you just kind of pray because I don't believe. Um, uh, that that people really connect over negativity. Because mm -hmm. let's say you and I go like, oh, I hate Justin Bieber. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah, I hate him too. Cool, we have a connection. Um, all right, so let, hey, next Thursday, let's not go to his concert. Mm -hmm. There's like nothing to build upon. <laughs> right. Hey, do do it's like, right, well, we both right, hate this, right. so let's that's not exactly consume right. it. Well, that's not an activity. That's exactly that's right. That's not an action. But if you and I go like, oh, I fucking love... That Neil Diamond, dude, he's playing in Vegas. Let's go! Yeah, yeah, now it's like it's like a positive step, you know, begats another positive step, and now we're now we're doing something. Yeah, I I, I didn't want to make Jasmine feel bad about. Oh, I don't feel bad learning from YouTube because I like if I needed like go to a party and wear a tie. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll go on YouTube and like look <laughs> how the, to tie a tie. The you know thing what I'm is, like, well, you have to use YouTube responsibly because mm -hmm. I use YouTube to braid my hair, if not let's braid shameless right, like, plug, mm -hmm. but. I looked at three different YouTubes before I started it because sure. you can see the first one and they show you a way to do it and you're like, oh, mm, I don't know if that one's the correct way. So you have people will just look at one video and say this is this instead of still doing research and looking at a couple of different By the videos. way, the <coughs> machine you're using, the computer has an algorithm that's mm -hmm. showing you what you like. So oh, you, yeah, you can't true. even really fight your way that out you of create. it. You gotta sign on to someone else's computer yeah. and see what the hell they or suggest Richard, for that person. Yeah. But I did change uh, recently a washer, uh, washer machine gasket that had gone bad. <laughs> and go, I got baby. it out of the box. I'm like, I can, f I can do this. I'm just gonna stare at it for a minute. I was like, I'm feeling lazy. Go on YouTube 30 mm -hmm. seconds later, you know, change Dunzo. that thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think I could do you. open heart surgery. I swear to God. Well, you build like <laughs> engines and shit, right? <laughs> sure. But I mean, this it's such a... builds engines from scratch. Between YouTube and Grey's Anatomy, I can <laughs> operate on anybody. I'll let you be my uh, point person on all my medical issues if you're watching Grey's. Now, shout out to my <laughs> man, John Forte. I went to visit him recently. Um, and he had a party in the barbecue, and we're at the barbecue. And I get into this conversation with this guy. He's, 
has a beautiful baby, this white couple, the bouncing beautiful baby baby boy. We start talking about children. And I mentioned I'm doing this show. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, your name came up. I mentioned I did Armchair Expert. He's like, I love that show and this uh-huh. and that. And and um we start talking about Joe Rogan. Oh, uh-huh. And um I tell him that I think last time I saw Joe Rogan, I was with you. Oh, at yeah, the, the store. store. Um, I tell him that I'm a fan of what Joe Rogan does and I respect him, but he said some things that I don't agree with and sure. he's also brought some people on that I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. And we start talking about that. And um, when, I, when I told him some of the things, like Joe Rogan had made a, a joke a few years ago about going to see Planet of the Apes. Mm-hmm. And then he went into the audience and the audience was the real Planet of the Apes. And the joke was it was like in a black neighborhood or something like that. It was a bad really? joke. Oh. Yeah, it was a, it was a bad joke. Hmm. Um, I hang out with a lot of comedians. Yeah. I don't always like all their jokes. Right. Yeah, um, right. You know, they, yeah. it was just, I, I know that he's a comedian as well, as well as the other things he, he does. So yeah. when I heard, when I saw the tape, I'm like, okay, he's a comedian. He went also too far see- for, for my taste, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But this guy, you know, he hadn't heard that. He started talking to me about, he's like, man, I love Joe Rogan because he puts people on that I like, like Jordan Peterson. Oh, uh-huh, sure. Right? Mm-hmm. And you and me talked about Jordan Peterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when no, I No, no, we talked mostly about Sam Harris. We did. We, we, yeah, yeah. we spoke about him for a second. You said yeah. you didn't fuck with him. Right, we, right, we, right. We, we, had a, we started debating more about Sam Harris. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I say that because um, as someone, who, now you're in this space. Uh-huh. Now you are a Joe Rogan. You know what I'm <laughs> Wait, saying? Which like, is wild. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like all, I th- although, I just will point out, I think his audience is almost all male and mine's almost all female. Mm. <laughs> So we're almost the opposite ladies like shows, Dex. but the ladies love Dex. <laughs> they like Kristen. And I think they're like, well, she likes him. Maybe I like him. Kristen's <laughs> But let's explore that. Yeah. So, so uh, do you think that were you going to ask no, if so I had some responsibility? Well, or no. So I'm just, I'm just. It's just interesting to me that he went to that name, and it's like I'm, I'm. I stopped having a conversation with him after that. Oh, really? Because. For me, at this wonderful barbecue with all these beautiful babies running around, yeah. I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, we're not going to agree about Jordan Peterson. Right. We're just not. No. I'm not going to cut any slack on that. Yeah. I'm going to just be hammering down on this guy yeah. while we're drinking beers at this barbecue. Yeah. And so it's like, now is not the time to have that debate. I agree with you. Um, I definitely will recognize, I, I like, I try to at least recognize when. I'm the unstoppable force and you're the immovable object and mm-hmm. there's no point, you know, mm-hmm. it's futile. So there, there are plenty of topics. Like I'm not gonna debate with someone who loves uh, God that mm-hmm. there's no God. Why, why, I, mm-hmm. no, why, why do that? Right. It's just and a waste of time. And that's, that, that makes you like the worst atheist ever. But what would be worth having, mm-hmm. I think, is a conversation where you like this dude, then you find out he likes Jordan Peterson. Mm-hmm. I guess it would be helpful if you were interested what is it about Jordan Peterson that he likes? Be- yeah, see, because I think that's relevant. I think people's mm-hmm. intentions are relevant as much as the pendulum si- seeming to swing in a direction where intentions are not relevant. You know, I, yeah. there's a difference between you're walking down the street and you could get like this and you look and a dude w- bumped into you on accident mm-hmm. versus a dude shoved you. Right. Well, the, what's the difference? The difference is the intention. And that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, when it comes to, like in that situation, I'm respecting my friend's house. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. If it was my home, I would have continued it. with the discussion. Right, right, right. And it would have right, been a respectful, right, right. Well, yeah. why do you like him? And Well, he said this, and I would have just... There's but a we phrase. like that, too. Like, right? We, we, we just yeah. like that. Without those people, what are you and I doing? That's right. Nothing. Sitting around right. agreeing with each other would be boring. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. We, need, we, need, we need to be able to ha- see different points of views. Yeah. But the intention thing is interesting to me because when it comes to oppression, mm-hmm. it is said that intent doesn't matter. Intentions don't matter because the result is always oppression. So you could say, I didn't mean to be racist. It doesn't matter if you, you were, were, if the racism still happened. But if we're talking about conversation and we're talking about debate and we're talking about the difference between you and me having a mutual respect for each other and agreeing to debate, right? Agreeing to sit yeah. down and talk, then if that's done out of respect. We, we, we talked about the fact that on social media, you don't get the same respect. Some anonymous guy named, Pig Hunter 82, whatever. I know, and you're giving him the same respect you'd give me or, you know, someone else you respect. Right, I'm not yeah. debating that guy. What, what I, the example I always give is, like, there's always a dude in front of 7-Eleven with a parrot on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. I, don't get, I don't get into a fight with that guy. <laughs> that guy is in front of 7-Eleven with a fucking parrot on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. I, we're probably not going to see eye to eye on mm-hmm. most things. Why, why even stop and do that? Mm-hmm. But uh, someone on Twitter, because it's in writing or something, it's, it seems to validate that, that mm-hmm. it's a real opinion. And I, I'll just remind myself, mm-hmm. like, this dude might be tweeting in front of 7-Eleven with a parrot on his shoulder. <laughs> That's a great visual. 
Or but, he might have been in uh, not the same classes. He might be a little bit, you know, I don't know the who correct knows termino what's happening. terminology, but he may not but, be as intelligent. But back to really quick, the mm -hmm. racist thing, which I, I totally agree with you. The, the intentions aren't, here's what I, here's what I reject personally, mm -hmm. is many things are sold to us as binary. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. Like mm -hmm. either intentions are everything or results are everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, fuck that. It's a stew. It's a context. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's both things. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, if That's someone said, was a though, victim of... when it of comes to oppression, like when it, when it comes to platform, because it, if it's about conversation, that's not it's the same context. Yes, and yeah. it, 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 I think we are smart enough and can deal in nuance enough, again, to draw a distinction between David Duke's motives... And Hillary Clinton's motives. I, I think, think we're it's smart enough. Right. Yeah. I think it's worse. We're we're elevated enough and that you, we can yeah. we can make a distinction there. There's 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 so much so much critique you can have of Hillary and Bill Clinton and things they've done from from Haiti, the hate the Clinton Foundation to to um, supporting the the crime bill in '94. Uh -huh. There's a super predator thing. There's so many she things supported you can say. Our, our war in Iraq. Right. There's so yeah. many things she's that you can say, but. Anyone who says that she's just as bad as a as a David Duke, or for me, if they say she's just as bad as Trump, mm -mm. I feel like that's a dishonest argument. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not buying into that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's a pretty uh, qualitative difference, in my opinion. Yeah. Between the and two and you, in order to be honest, you have to be able to say everything that she does do that you critique that are well, bad. But, it, yeah, but, but you this, have to be honest about it. This is another soapbox of mine, though. I think we've entered an era where, yeah, you and I debated this. Is um, you have to be in 100% what someone believes mm -hmm. to publicly say you like the person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's horseshit. There, there I, are people that, that, that make great points on one topic and they're totally out to lunch on another. That's right. Thing. And so I can celebrate. Ben Carson, I'm sure, is a great neurosurgeon. I'm sure he's <laughs> is he? he doesn't believe in evolution. I'm like, how, does, <laughs> how are you going to let a guy I mean, he had a gifted hands. You. His hands is gifted, you know? I hope, they're, yeah, I hope he's in a state of flow and he's not thinking about what they're doing. Um, but I, I, you know, I think that um, I really thoroughly enjoyed and got a lot out of our debate about Sam Harris because I feel like right now I feel like we still disagree about Sam Harris. Sure, yeah, but, yeah. But what I realized was the, the fallout of that was there were a lot of people, I think, who might agree with you or might agree with me who saw that and say, here's two pe people who respect each other who can have a disagreement and still talk about it. And yeah. people want to see a lot more of that in this country. That, and that, I think we gave them a good example of it. That's my favorite part of the takeaway. I, I, don't, I didn't care how many checks I had in my category of people mm -hmm. who agreed with me or how many had in you. What I was most happy about was how many people just voiced that exact right. observation. Like, right. oh, these dudes got up, hugged, lo loved each other, right. and they don't agree on this right. one or two things. And it makes me think that I could still bring you around on Sam Harris. So I'm like, it's still open. It's going to be tough because we're friends. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. And I have friends. I have friends. I'm, I promise you I have friends that you are probably oh. diametrically opposed to philosophically on certain issues. Yes. I promise you I do. Yes. They're probably not as famous uh, as Sam Harris or in the national conversation like Sam Harris is. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm also coming from a much different place than you that I acknowledge. Like, mm -hmm. I'm totally empowered. I'm a six foot two white dude. It's mm -hmm. white boy day all the time So for you're me. acknowledging your privilege. I am. Jared so, said, we did a, we did a Angela Rye on this show, and Jared said, I've never seen two people acknowledge their privilege more in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was younger, I loved Ice Cube. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, at least for me at 19, mm -hmm. a pretty militant, pro-black, uh, pro anti-white at times mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. And of course I could enjoy it because that man wasn't eventually going to uh, stand in the way of me accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. So I could enjoy it and be fine with the fact that he hates some section of white people. Uh, if it were reversed, if, if I was black and it was uh, fucking the hammer skins or whatever Nazi band, mm -hmm. that's very scary because that dude might be a judge or something. You know, mm -hmm. so I recognize that. Um, and it's hard for me not to go like, well, look, I loved Ice Cube and I loved all these people mm -hmm. that, you know, sometimes he can get a movie greenlit these days, though. Oh, yeah. Well, he <laughs> yeah, he, he, he and he obviously, you know, he entered. It's kind of what you said about punk. It's like a lot of times the thing that brings you to the party mm -hmm. isn't the thing that you should double down on to stay at the party. Right. So he kind of he evolved and changed in real time and. Or maybe he didn't. Maybe he has the exact same views. But no, he, I think I think Ice Cube absolutely evolved in his rhetoric and his language. He, I think his political views are the same, but I think he's smarter and more strategic and more tactical. Yes. As a young, fiery, sort of punk rock 
hip hop thing. He's like, fuck the police. Yeah. These fuck motherfuckers is they fucking fucking me out of these contracts. America spelled I'm with hanging, a triple K. Yeah, like yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 That's exactly right. Ice Cube <laughs> was pulling no punches. He's my favorite rapper back in the day. Yeah, I loved him. Um, loved him. I I don't want to. You know, we we had a great conversation about Sam Harris on your show. Yeah. And I don't want this to be the Sam Harris show. I will say, <laughs> I will say that if he's your friend, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to get him to rethink his position on Charles Murray and the bell curve. That's just I think, terrible, terrible well, stuff. But I, I think he has. Okay. I think he has. I think when he had Ezra on, Ezra Klein, mm -hmm. I think... Ez I saw that. You did? I did watch that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, Ezra clearly just knew a lot more about Charles Murray mm -hmm. than um, I think Sam did, than I did. Mm -hmm. Uh, he knew about what political agenda he ultimately was exposed to have, that he was a part of a think tank that proposed bills that, mm -hmm. you know, would. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and I just want to be clear on what I was uh, even supporting or defending in that is that I think his work's rubbish. Mm -hmm. I think it's horseshit that there is a, uh, a, a population or racial or uh, ethnic ethnicity bi bias in, in intelligence or, or difference. Mm -hmm. I just, as an anthropology major, I, that's not what I think. Mm -hmm. But I defend the right of someone to publish research that they have come up with and oh, then let absolutely. that be attacked. And I don't think absolutely. that person should be put in a jail cell. I and I kind of think that's what Sam, I think Sam um, got a little bit uh, myopic in that position. That, the which as we pointed speech. out, he feels like he has been often um, challenged in his right to have controversial opinions. And so, of course, that's the thing he I, he, he most empathized with mm -hmm. this person. And I I don't think he would defend Charles. Yeah, Trump. I think that that's, that speaks to the, the privilege that you brought up. Mm -hmm. Is that if you're, I this I get this all the time. He Look, can wrote, afford to. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to make an issue. I wrote an essay called uh, Free Speech or Die. I'll, uh -huh. I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, and the premise of the essay was that freedom of speech is one of the greatest things on earth. It's one of the yes. greatest principles of all time. Mm -hmm. um, we should celebrate it. I use my free speech very often. Mm -hmm. um, I Right now, I am uh, banned from certain German venues because I support the idea that people should have the right to want to uh, boycott Israel if they feel like that. Uh -huh. Right? I'm not the boycott Israel guy. I'm not the boycott anybody guy. But uh -huh. if people want to do it and people ask me to respect the boycott, I'm like, I respect your right to boycott. And somehow, I, I got a Muslim name. So I right. become the face for this thing, right? Right. I'm not complaining about being disinvited from these venues. They have every right to disinvite me from these They're venues. They're a business. I, have, I use my free speech to say what I want to say. And if that means that you don't want me in your venue, I don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. right. But I think a lot of people on, on the right wing and a lot of people who live this life of privilege, they don't face the same amount of oppression. Everyone faces a little bit of oppression. I, Sam Harris, well, I don't Well, life know. is oppressive. Let's right, just right? start so with that. It's all relative, You enter right? as a, a public school... And people are bigger than you, or smaller right. than you, or prettier than you, or uglier. You, and just there's yeah. levels to it, right? Yes, just, yes, just like yes, you yes. said, there's levels to between uh, David Duke and Hillary Clinton. Yes. You know what is oppressive? Junk food. It is oppressive. Yeah, we, it's so hard. <laughs> we have things it is built oppressive. to kill us yeah. that are uh, very good initially. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyways. But no, I just think that um, when you're, you become tone deaf and like you said, myopic when you're looking for reasons to be oppressed that are not there. Mm -hmm. The uh -huh. idea that Jordan Peterson's freedom of speech is under threat to me is a ridiculous thing to defend because I think that if I wanted to put on a, a, a Nazi suit mm -hmm. and we'll go goose stepping down the street in yeah. America, I have the right to do it. Right. If somebody punches me in the face, they they are going to get arrested. That's right. I'm not going to get arrested, which means my freedom of speech is well protected. Mm -hmm. There's consequences for that. Mm -hmm. But if that person is okay with facing those consequences, you might have to be okay with getting punched in the face for saying some Nazi shit. Yeah, you know. We, and we and, just we just debate we just debated this, mm -hmm. uh, Monica and I. And uh, again, I don't think it's a, a binary mm -hmm. uh, proposition. Uh, a big part of me is like, no, peaceful protest is the way. I agree. Gandhi. Martin Luther King. Peace is to go. Love is to go. Peace is to go. Yeah. But no justice, no what, peace. What's exactly considered a peaceful protest then? Because I was a part of a, pe a peaceful protest and I ended up in jail. So. Well, that's kind of, uh, if the peaceful protest goes correctly, you should end up in jail. People should see it and people should have a wake-up call where they're like, that's crazy. Why are we doing this? Oh, Let's okay. change our policy. Yeah, that's what MLK and them was doing. Yeah. Uh, Cornell West does that, you know. He it, shows up it, with the intention of, 
I might get arrested because that's the visual that's going to change spur people to change minds. Now, so with that said, I can also say I would not be a good candidate for peaceful protests. If I lived in a community that was being physically assaulted by other human beings, I feel like I would assault back. So I can acknowledge that mm -hmm. I'm asking someone to do something I wouldn't. Well, that's what Antifa is, right? Like, I've the when I the protests I've been at, and you run into these Antifa people, like mostly mostly white people. Antifa is not a white group, but there's a lot of white people. A lot of them recognize that black people, we kid the guy who punched Richard Spencer in the face. Uh -huh. I think that he comes from a crew of people like a black guy can't do that. No, you know what I'm right, saying? The black right, guy can't right, be running right. around punching people in the face. So yeah. as a white person, I'm gonna use my privilege to punch this Nazi in the face because I know it's probably going to be easier for me to get out of that situation. Yeah, yeah. I just, it, I guess it's, you're really, it, it boils down to as well, are you taking kind of a utilitarian view of it? Like what is, does, does the, does the means justify the ends mm -hmm. or uh, does the ends justify the means or the means justify the ends? Is it a Kantian viewpoint? What should you do in that moment? Or are you, or are you just looking for what the end result mm -hmm. is and is it worth that sacrifice? And those are just, they're, Look, they're debates that have been raging mm -hmm. since fucking Plato, and they're right. hard. And again, they're kind of like the two virtues we have. Like, it's, it's, at best, it's going to be some compromise of these things. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, can I tell you guys my favorite video of white privilege? <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's this guy, and he looks like a hippie. He has long hair, or whatever, and he's talking to somebody who's like uh, protesting abortion, mm -hmm. and they said something about oh, we should be um, abortion is bad, and he literally steps back and does this round house kick and kicks her phone out of her hand and I'm like a black person can never do that <laughs> but it was so funny I watched it like 10 times I need to see this send oh, we it to have, me. I will send it to you now you so it's weird though uh, just to put a pin in my because uh, I gave two examples of where I thought it was effective and worked um, I also think the Black Panther thing in Oakland with the guns was compelling and interesting and, yeah, and, and got them got them into the state senate and got them mm -hmm. heard and so you know again the laws I, were changed after that gun laws were changed yeah, forever yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you did protest uh, when you did not get married until gay people could get married in California. That's a form of protest. Thank yep. you. Yep, 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 yep. Um, uh, yes, and uh, I don't know if you like this comparison, but uh, <laughs> it's a dicey like comparison. It's, it's been met. Yeah, it's been met with like fifty-fifty. Yeah, uh, they like it or they don't like it. You know, a lot of our friends are gay, and uh, it felt very weird to ask a big section of our friends to come celebrate a right we had and they didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I said it would be like if all your friends were black and you threw a party at the front of the bus in the 50s. Mm. <laughs> good analogy or bad? Good one. No, that's actually a good one. I think that it's only bad when um, a lot of people try to compare gay rights to black rights. But that analogy was actually spot on because that's pretty much what it is. No, she is exactly right. And there's, there is, there, there, there's, there's, there's credible critique of people trying to compare gay rights to black rights mm -hmm. and there's completely ridiculous critique mm -hmm. of that you know what i'm saying because it's all civil rights mm -hmm. but yeah. i think that's an apt me too i uh, agree comparison and i also want to say thank you for protesting gay marriage because uh are you married to I'm, a woman i'm not but oh. you know i just got broken up with but maybe <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we could we can be now so. <laughs> she's now on the market i'm on the Market. The market well, decides. Can I just, I want to tell one little story because it really, it really is, it's, it's totally on topic of what we're kind of talking about, about remaining open ear. So um, Ted Olson, do you know who that guy is? Mm -hmm. he, Ted Olson, I think, is the most successful lawyer at arguing in front of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. in, in the last 50 years or something. Now, he's a right, he's on the right. He, so here's a very bad thing about him, he, he got Citizens United upheld. Mm -hmm. That's him. Okay. Also, he's the one who defeated DOMA. Defeated who? DOMA, the, the, the marriage equality. Right. He's the one who argued that case in the, in the Supreme Court and won for gay rights. Right. And we had dinner with him one time, my wife and I. And he was getting up and the um, uh, server, male server, was standing there when he stood up and he was already crying. Mm. And he said, can I hug you? You, you? you let me marry the person oh. I love. And I'm like... See, that's everything. Like, here's a guy who he did some stuff I don't agree with. Then he did this thing that here's this man crying. He changed mm -hmm. his life. You know, we can't just be throwing everyone out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it, life's more complicated than that. It's mm -hmm. more complex. Here's this dude who's uh, at one time, you know, against your interests and one time is a hero for your interests. And it's just uh, it's, I, it's very compelling, I think, or mm -hmm. it's interesting. People can change. 
And that's why I agree with that cancel. <clears throat> well, I don't even think culture. that what 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 you're saying is so much that people can change because I do think people can change, but I think it's like uh, respecting duality and respecting yeah it's not black or white the guy's not right. good or evil in this one case in my opinion he was a saint in the other case i think he d dismantled part of the most important part of the government so yeah. it's like i think i gotta really, reconcile that it does depend on where, where your priorities stand mm -hmm. yeah you know it depends on what's important to you and you know and but that's something that you have to grapple with yeah. you know that's something that you in your own morality wherever it comes from you have to figure out this i can't cross this line this line i'm I'm okay with if it means getting to this point. Yeah, well, I, th I think the best example I can give is uh, Obama was publicly... It's a good example. ...and expressly against gay marriage. He's against gay marriage. And he he's put in policy. Out, he's spoken out against reparations. He's mm -hmm. had a horrible immigration policy. Mm -hmm. I also went to several events at the White House. Uh -huh. Obama's invitation yeah. that I enjoyed. Yes, so, so you're right. There is I, some duality. I, I, there. I, yeah, I, I was very pro gay marriage. Uh, he was against it. I still ultimately loved him and prayed he'd come around, which he did. And so, um, see, the pray you come around thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're holding out for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to change gears a little bit. Uh, one of your biggest obsessions is Jay Z. Oh. Please tell us why. <laughs> You heard that? He's like, oh. <laughs> I love Jay Z too. I'm from New York. We all love Hove. Yes, we right love here. Hove. Bring them on. They're throwing up the rock sign in the back. Bring them on. Heard a lot of motherfuckers saying they made Hove. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, make, make another, another Hove. Make another Hove. Uh, oh, in fact, that's one of the times I defended you before we were friends. What happened? I, I quoted that one time. Ah, Someone okay. was coming after you like, we, we made you. Right. You better shut the fuck up. We want you to just play music. <laughs> People right. And then I wrote, a lot of motherfuckers saying they made Hove. <laughs> so, okay. So anyways, I, that's one of the... Um, you know, A, I just liked his music. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, uh, the documentary that was about him, was it called... It wasn't called Black and White. Back, it, it was when he was retiring, he made the blue... The Black Album. Black Album. There was a documentary. It was fantastic. And he went around, and, and, and you kind of, um, for me, a lay person who doesn't know how you guys make songs, he went to Kanye, and that was back before mm -hmm. Kanye was uh, um, rapping, and he just said, what do you got? And he's like, I got five songs. All right, play them for me. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, I want, and he buys three songs, mm -hmm. basically. And then he sat there, and he sat there, and he sat there, and he walked into the fucking booth. Now, maybe it was editing, and maybe it was bullshit. No, he did maybe that. it was smoking no, mirrors. No, he did that. But he walked into the booth and laid down that song with those rhymes that are so complex and pay off a verse later and the references and fucking Godfather references mm -hmm. and um, should have stayed in food and beverage. And I'm like, how can a human's mind listen to a that. song for 12 minutes, w walk into the booth and throw that down? That's like Picasso. That's like, I mean, that's like Picasso, historically. Baby. Yeah. yeah. That's Once a in a mind. fucking millennia. I mean, I just was like, this guy is something else. That's something I, that's not something I cannot do. Uh-huh. I have done that before. I have written in the booth. Uh-huh. But that's not what I do. Right. Like, what I do is I write, I sit there and write. I'm glad I'm, you we're, do we're what you do. Right. Yeah. I'm right. glad you do, because you your songs do the same thing for me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I appreciate, like, when I look at Jay-Z doing that, he's not the only artist that does it, but he's the most famous and most proficient at it. Yeah, it's incredible. Talks about real watch. things while he's doing it, because a lot of people can listen to a beat and then go on the um, in the box, but it's we don't want to hear it. You know what I mean? It's mumble rap or something like that. But the way mm -hmm. you build up to taking Vicodin pills to numb the way that they feel, like mm -hmm. there's, you're doing a five part essay. Mm -hmm. You had a thesis statement, and then you led me to that point, and I'm like, ooh, he built me up to that. It and, was that crazy. and that's the punchline. I'm glad you noticed that because the way that I write. It's like Chappelle said, he says he keeps a, a jar full of punchlines. Uh -huh. Like that's how, I, that's how I write. I think of where I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the writing is how do I get to how that? Get yes. You know? yes. Is it, is You're it like the same walking up a staircase when I'm listening to your stuff and then I get to the vantage point. I'm like, oh, now is, it's all, now I got the whole thing. Is it the same with writing films? Uh, yeah, you know, every, uh, or not every, but uh, many writers are different mm -hmm. in that typically writers tend to, of screenplays, tend to be strong in one of the three acts or two mm -hmm. of the three acts. 
a lot of people have hard times with endings. And you mm. see it in movies. You're like, mm. Where, how are they going to tie that? Where, and then how do we get here? Mm. My thing is I generally start with I know the beginning and the end. And then the middle is where I get to be surprised mm. and find stuff and uh, improv and, and figure fun things out, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I kind of know, similarly to you, I know I'll, I'll generally think of an ending to a movie I want to see and then reverse mm. engineer it from there and think, like, what can I lay along the way that will pay off in that mm. way. What's a, what's a project that you really want to write about, like, that's in your mind, interesting date? I don't ever want to write again. I wrote, oh, <laughs> well, I wrote Damn. for like 12 years straight. I, saw, I just saw you in your writing chair on Ellen. It what? It, with the writing <laughs> chair, the chair, the lazy boy chair. Oh, yeah, You're like, yeah, I yeah. write in this chair. Well, like. yeah, that's true. I have written <laughs> screenplays in that chair. But you know, I um, I wrote for 12 years pretty solidly. Uh, I always had something due. Um, Chips came out, it didn't do well at the box office. And I said, I'm gonna take a break from writing. And it has been the most luxurious two years of my last 15 years. Mm. Because as a writer, Lawrence Kazin, who wrote um, Close Encounter, or rather, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of the most prolific, mm -hmm. best writers of all time in movies, he said, uh, writers are people who have agreed to do homework the rest of their oh, lives. Yeah. And that's exactly <laughs> oh, how it, yeah. it used to be. Like We were just on vacation in Michigan, my wife and I, and I was sitting on that beach, and I was sitting on the beach. There was nothing I had to do, but prior to that, everywhere we were sitting, even if it was downtime, I'm like, I gotta finish that thing. That mm -hmm. thing's due this point, and I, 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 you know, I do think I'll write again. But I've been really enjoying not writing for a couple of years. I, I like not having mm -hmm. homework. Now you said when we came in, you said you saw the uh, Lamar Odom episode of People's Party. Yeah. And you said you were drawn to it because of his addiction issues. Yes. You have famously had addiction issues. Oh yeah. And you famously went sober. Yeah. And um, how is sobriety affecting your work? How is it affecting Creative your family process. life? Um, well, I wouldn't have a family without sobriety, mm. first and foremost. Uh, Belle would have never signed up for <laughs> the old version of me. <laughs> she would have been like, you're funny, but not that funny. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it, it not only, you know, and it's common to say in AA or 12-step programs, like, uh, you come in to quit drinking, but then what you stay for is why did you drink mm. and, and how, how do I fix the foundation that's cracked? so that I don't have that desire, you know, that I'm not carrying around shame, that I'm not carrying around resentments, that I'm not doing all this stuff. And that's so much of what appeals to it about me, that the, the quitting Coke and everything um, ended almost 15 years ago, but the, the personal journey of why I was even doing it to begin with uh, continues. Mm. And um, for me, if I could isolate, like, the reward of sobriety, again, just for me, is... When I was 12 years old, I woke up and it was game on. It was fucking party time. Wow. I was gonna meet up with Aaron, we were gonna fucking walk through this field, we were gonna go ride a dirt bike, we were gonna get in a fight, we were, whatever. Mm -hmm. Everything was on fire. I was thrilled to be on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered getting fucked up, which was awesome for mm -hmm. 10 years. But that 12 year old fire, that, that, that mm -hmm. just passion to be alive, it totally had gone away, and it was gone for a long time. Wow. And I just thought, if I could ever get back to the point where when I walk out my door, I'm thrilled to, to go on an adventure with nothing in me but oatmeal, like, that's the goal. It's, and I can honestly say for that. about the last seven years, like, I'm on fire to be alive. I'm mm -hmm. on fire to go do stuff and just have fun, and yeah. I don't need anything yeah, to get man. me pumped up for that. You're very productive these days. It's crazy, because I was talking to... Um, <laughs> I was talking to one of my friends, and it's like, how do we go out in high school and party all night without any alcohol? And it's like now you have to pregame before you go anywhere. Like, yeah. it's crazy that you once you start drinking or smoking or doing whatever, you start relying on those things to give you your energy and your get up and go when you already had that. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm the most pro drugs and alcohol sober person you'd meet like <laughs> i i am very inf i don't think anyone should leave planet earth without doing mushrooms oh and yeah ecstasy. i i hope she my <laughs> i hope my children do mushrooms when they get older um i hope they don't do cocaine because that in my experience will make you not be allowed to do all the other things um so i'm very pro i'm not 
judgmental of it. Um, I'm always interested in other addicts. I'm interested mm -hmm. to hear, you know, I'm cynical because I've been going to meetings for 15 years and I've watched at this point at least 10,000 people try to get sober. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a pattern that I'm not willing to deny. Mm -hmm. And I know there's certain ingredients you kind of need to get long lasting sobriety. So someone like uh, Lamar, I have only observed from what I read in the news. I can relate to the dude that's gotten lost in Nevada mm. and is having a heart attack and all like I, 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 I've been in a very, you know, dark similar spot mm. and I genuinely hope he finds the road to okay. sustain sobriety. Right and so I watch it with interest of like Hmm, do I think he's got, you know, is he, on, is he on the way? With this knowledge of these all these meetings that you've been to. Yes. So, yes. and again, I don't claim that this is the only approach. Mm -hmm. Again, I, there's, I, I don't care. I don't have fucking stock in 12-step. Right. Uh, but I am a little suspicious of the new solution to addiction being going on an ayahuasca trip. I just don't think that, <laughs> you know, ayahuasca. For, 14 years of trauma is erased by a four hour experience mm -hmm. in a hut in Peru with a dude shit in his pants. Maybe mm -hmm. it is, I'm just a little uh, skeptical of it. What do you do to cope now, like without doing any drugs or anything like that? Like when you're stressed and you wanna smoke a blunt, mm -hmm. what do you do instead? Um, I work out, I, um, I'm into, cause I think really what is what the appeal of drugs was for me was a couple things. Once I do one line of coke, my uh, uh, my my priorities are straight. Oh, yeah. All I got to do is get more mm -hmm. coke. Mm -hmm. I don't care what, what I got to do career-wise. I don't care how bad of a son I was or this or that. I have a, a singular objective and singular focus feels good. It is mm -hmm. a relief to have singular focus. So now I have a lot of hobbies that require singular focus. Mm -hmm. I go to the motorcycle track a lot. I'm going this weekend to Laguna mm -hmm. Seca. You wear you overalls. <laughs> no, no, I'll be in full leathers. <laughs> I should have leather overalls made. Oh, yes, you should. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm doing that activity, I can only afford to look at the next turn. If I think about anything else, I'm off the track and That's I'm on the way to the hospital. So I mm. enjoy singular focus in, 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 in uh, shutting out all the, uh, the voices in my mm. head, the racket, the hamster on the wheel. So I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to things that require 100% of my attention. That's so funny because you learned that in method acting. Like we did an exercise where it's like you have to do one, I don't know if it was method acting, but it was an acting class. And you had to do one thing that you had to do repeti repetitively that you didn't, couldn't focus on anything else. Uh -huh. And so my thing was cutting carrots. You're cutting carrots, you're focusing on cutting the carrots so your mind is just uh -huh. on that. And when your mind's on that, it can't be, oh, there's a camera there and I feel mm -hmm. a little insecure. Or I gotta, it becomes yeah. more natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have two more questions. Good. And this has been wonderful. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Me too. Um, not so much, the first one's not so much a question, it's an observation. I noticed through your film work and the, the, the films that you have control over, you uh, always have your friends and family involved. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. there's certain directors who do that. You look at a Spike Lee or you look at the Coen brothers or you look at, you know, certain people that are always using the same cast of people. But with you, you're putting like your brother uh -huh. and your sister in the movie. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, why is that so important to you? Well, there's uh, a couple things. One is, um, th for me, the the more I focus on the uh, the process of making something mm -hmm. versus the results of making th something, uh, the happier I am. Mm -hmm. So I want the process to be the party, not the right. fucking opening weekend. Because because right. one thing is two years of my life. The other thing is a Friday night. So I'm not going to sit back when I'm 90 and look at printouts of what my shit did, what mm -hmm. ratings it got, I'm gonna be thinking about like, oh my God, my brother was on yeah, set. He yeah. thought he was gonna be a great actor and then he shit his pants and it's time <laughs> for him to be an actor. That was delicious, you know, that, that stuff. But, and then, and then it, just from a practical standpoint, I like to be able to write the script knowing who's gonna play it because I know what they can do and right. I, I know how, you know what their sweet spot is and it's fun to like just drop someone in their sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I think it's a real advantage. Um, to, to just understand what gears people have and be able to play to those strengths is I think it's helpful. beautiful, man. I'm in the po point in my career where I'm involving family more, and so uh -huh. when I well, see that Well, your son's you, doing this now, Yeah, right? you know, my son raps, my daughter raps. My son doesn't just rap. He'd be mad if I said that. Uh -huh. my son He'll makes be music. mad whatever you say. Yeah, he makes, he makes music. <laughs> he, it's a child's he creates, job. Right. Um, you're good friends with Tom Arnold. Mm-hmm. Um, seems like a great guy. Uh-huh. 
he has said that he has these tapes of Trump calling people the N-word on The Apprentice. So mm -hmm. my question is, is that maybe there's a non-disclosure or something. Maybe he can't release the tapes. Can you bring me over his house? Can I hear the tapes? <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Can I hear the tapes? <laughs> now, let me, I, I want to ask a more global question. Okay. Do you think if, A, if those tapes exist, uh -huh. I personally have no information on that. Right. If they exist and they were released, mm -hmm. do you think it does anything? No. No, I do not. No. To That's me, why it's I just said, like, yeah. It, do we, like, my, my thought is just. This like, guy said he's going to grab the pussies. Like, exactly. it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Once you win an election after mm -hmm. saying you just grabbed their pussy, mm -hmm. I, I just think that, you know, there is this kind of um, repetitive. It's a little bit of my frustration with the left is just this, like, uh, reconfirming we don't like this guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're clear. We've been clear for three years. Mm -hmm. I got it. Don't like yeah, the dude. I, agree the I want to put this energy into all this talk. Go to your neighbor's house and ask them to vote. I agree with that. The whole like he's orange and his small hands and the smoking <laughs> gun. There's this never going to be a smoking it means, gun. All that stuff means nothing. He's, no. He he he's the president. Yeah. We have to deal with it, mm -hmm. and um, we have to deal with it efficiently. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I I agree that the sort of the the sort of the meme war thing, like the yeah. you know the left can't meme. It's the, all that stuff is fucking meaningless i have to say you know i i think uh again i don't think it's black or white i'm not like 90 percent on mm -hmm. this but i am 55 percent we should not try to impeach this guy uh, I mean, he's yeah he's almost uh, done now yeah i'm like guys well, uh, we're gonna vote I, we're gonna vote and you know this is what I, I will think I, I do think as a as a pragmatist mm -hmm. um knowing what our country is and knowing how it works i don't think it's possible right, yeah well it's it's not i do think that to try it and make sort of a symbolic, a symbolic impeachment mm -hmm. like they did with Clinton. Yeah. I would totally be behind that. I mean, yes. So again, it's like it, one is almost a Kantian argument, which is y you do the right thing because it's the right thing. So if this person has abused this office in a way that we are constitutionally empowered to uh, check, mm -hmm. we have an obligation to do that. Mm -hmm. So regardless of the, the ends, we do the right means. That's one argument. Yeah. It's very valid. That's the one I'm on the side of. Definitely. Yeah. And then the, the other argument is like, well, what's the end result of this? Well, the end result is he's not getting kicked out of office. The Senate is never going to vote in, mm -hmm. in, in that uh, way. So we know immediately he won't be out of office. Right. So now you just look at the manpower, the attention, all that stuff. I would rather all that attention and energy and passion being put into something that was going to have a productive outcome. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, Maybe a you know, candidate. That could a candidate, him. an infrastructure process, uh, yeah. a solution to the immigration issues. You know, mm -hmm. any, like take that 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 that, that capital, that that intel, you know, intellectual capital and, and the resources and the passion, and just let's solve a few problems. I think we're a little s stuck on the Trump thing, and it's like it, we got a lot of other things mm -hmm. that we could be making better we're not going to make this better for another 18 mm. months i still want to hear them tapes though so tell you man, <laughs> tell your man we're gonna have a party like y'all what do you hear it? i was this is you and this is me you. i hate him <laughs> i knew it i knew it <laughs> now i now i got proof confirmation bias <laughs> yes you, ladies and gentlemen dax shepherd <laughs> thanks for having yeah! me